Anna Sester here again with another great family history story. A few years ago, I was researching a French Canadian line with a surname of Limoges. And this line goes back really far in Quebec and back to France. French Canadian ancestry is so interesting to research and it's remarkably easier than other groups in the United States and Canada. And this is because the Catholic Church kept such meticulous records throughout the world. Genealogists love researching groups that keep such excellent records. Now the caveat with French Canadian records is you either need a French translator or be able to translate the records yourself. I took seven years of French between high school and college, so while I'm not fluent in speaking French, I'm pretty good at translating written French. With Catholic Church records, you can access baptisms, which provide a birth date uh, and place in parents' names. You can access marriage records, which provide a marriage date, the place, and parents of the bride and the groom's names. And there's also burial records, which provide a death date, place of burial, and a spouse or parent's names. Basically, these records are like little mini trees, providing family information to get you one step further back in your tree. So in this particular project, I got back from a living Limoges to her three times great-grandfather, Louis Limoges, born in 1797, and he died in 1883 in Quebec, and we have a copy of his baptism record in French. If we take a look at his record, and if you can read French, it states that his parents are Francois Limoges and Marie Rousseau, that's how easy these records are. We're now back another generation. They're also great for confirming if you have the right person on a record by matching parents between records. The only problem I've run into with Quebec French Canadian records is that people name their children with the same names. There are tons of Maurice, Francois, Louise. So you do have to make sure you're in the right location by keeping track of the family through the generations and by matching your parents and siblings to make sure you have the right person. So I continued in this manner, researching the line for two or more generations. And often I'll take a break and I'll research a wife's line in between just to work on a different family for a while. So I got back two more generations on this Limoges line to Francois's parents, Francois Limoges and Marie Coron. At this point, I was ready for a switch in the family. So I decided to look into Marie Coron's family. Marie was born January 16, 1720 in Quebec and died March 19, 1799. I'm not sure if you noticed, but both Marie and her grandson, the, story, the start of our whole story, Louis, they lived really long lives. Very unusual for this time period as life was much harder and required more physical labor on a daily basis. So that led to a rundown of the body and accidents that maimed or killed people. But let's take a look at Marie's baptism record. Marie's parents are Francois Coron and Marie Siri. I was on a kick of looking for female records because unlike U.S. records, there are actually birth records with the female's maiden name in them, in these Catholic records. So I was on a kick and kept following that female line. So let's take a look at another baptism record for Marie's mother, Marie Siri. She was born December 4th, 1684 in Quebec. Yeah, we are really getting back there in history now. So let's get a little history lesson to put these people in context. The 1660s saw the largest colonization effort in Quebec by the French. Although they'd been in the area since 1529 when Jacques Cartier explored the St. Lawrence River, many of the colonists to New France who settled in Quebec, they were marriageable young women. The French government under King Louis XIV decided to make a big push for colonization in the New World. And they sent young women to marry these young men that were already there, and they wanted to just naturally grow the colony. These girls were called Fidora, daughters of the king, because they were given a dowry and their supplies and passage were paid by the king. Sometimes they received upwards of a hundred pounds above the payment of their supplies and passage. For a young woman in France who is of limited means, this was an enormous amount of money. Additionally, these women had a choice in who they married once they arrived in Quebec. So we know that Marie Serre was born in Quebec, so she's not one of these Fidera, but perhaps her mother or grandmother was. But that's a story for another time. I did continue going through the baptism records, looking for Marie Serre's mother, who was named Elizabeth Charbonneau. 
because that name stopped me in my tracks. What's up with that? Well, Charbonneau is a well-known name in U.S. history. He was the man hired by Lewis and Clark in the early 1800s to help navigate them through the Louisiana Territory to the Pacific Ocean. He was supposed to provide translation services with the native tribes they met. However, historians believe Lewis and Clark hired Toussaint Charbonneau for one reason, because his wife's knowledge of the territory and her ability to speak the native tongue to the tribes in the region provide that translation to her husband, who could then translate it into French, which Lewis and Clark could understand. His wife was Sacagawea, a Shoshone captured by another tribe as a child. She had in-depth knowledge of the people and the land that Lewis and Clark would be traveling through. So, was Sacagawea part of this line I was researching? Let's find out. First, I found Elizabeth's baptism record. She was born July 11, 1664 in Quebec to Olivier Charbonneau and Marie-Marguerite Garnier. Since Elizabeth was born in Quebec, she's not one of these Fidoirs either. However, we are now looking for a link to Sacagawea. So I needed to look at her Charbonneau line and her siblings to see if one of their lines led to Toussaint Charbonneau and Sacagawea. Since we were now in the late 1600s with births and Toussaint was born in the late 1700s, I started looking at Elizabeth's siblings and then going down their descendant line. Elizabeth had a brother named Mikael, born two years after her, and we have a baptism record for him. As you can see, the parents on his baptismal record are the same as Elizabeth's, Olivier and Marie-Marguerite Garnier. So this is indeed Elizabeth's brother. Mikael married Mar Marguerite de Noyon on November 12, 1692 in Boucherville, Quebec. Looking at his marriage record, it states that his parents are Olivier Charbonneau and Marie Garnier. We have the same Michel then. Michel and Marguerite had a son named Jean Charbonneau on August 19, 1697. I continued to look down this family line to see if Toussaint shows up. So Jean Charbonneau married Marie Catherine Denio, and they had a son named Jean Baptiste Charbonneau. This name piqued my interest because I knew that Toussaint and Sacagawea named their son Jean Baptiste. Often in genealogy, you'll see like given names repeated, especially for sons and grandsons. Maybe I was on the right line. Continuing down this line, Jean Baptiste Charbonneau married Marguerite de Nio on March 1, 1756, in Boucherville, Quebec. There's one discrepancy in the marriage record of Jean Baptiste and Marguerite. The document names Jean-Baptiste's grandfather, Michel, as his father, instead of Jean. This may have been a mistake by the priest who uh, wrote down the record, as, uh, or perhaps Jean the father was dead and Michel the grandfather was standing in. I'm not sure, but I definitely know that this is his Jean-Baptiste's marriage record. And we find that this is the correct marriage record because there's a baptismal record showing Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau and Marguerite de Nio as the parents of Toussaint Charbonneau, born March 21st, 1767. Did we find the link to Sacagawea through her husband, Toussaint? I had to make sure that I had the correct Toussaint Charbonneau and that he belonged in this line. This Toussaint Charbonneau was born in Boucherville, Quebec, which was correct for where the parents lived. His date of birth would make his age accurate for the time he was known by Lewis and Clark. Additionally, Toussaint's father, Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau, died in Detroit, June 9, 1791. So Detroit was a frontier at the time of Jean-Baptiste's death, and it was part of French Canada at this time as well, not part of the U.S. At some point in Toussaint's childhood, the family moved to Detroit, where his father died. This would account for why Toussaint was known in the Northern Plains region of the U.S., and we no longer see him in any Quebec records. Last, this Toussaint Charbonneau died in North Dakota with the Mandan people, it's an Indian tribe, Native American tribe, on August 12, 1843. This was the same Toussaint Charbonneau that married Sacagawea and was part of the Lewis and Clark expedition. So what was the relationship of Toussaint Charbonneau to the descendant I was doing family research for? They were second cousins seven times removed. They shared the same ancestor, Olivier Charbonneau, 
who was Toussaint's great-grandfather, and my client's eighth great-grandfather, making Sacagawea related to her by marriage and her son, Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau, we have a picture here, my client's fourth cousin six times removed. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, click like and then to subscribe. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications for our next video. This is Anna Sester, and I hope you enjoyed I Dig Dead People.